And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Good morning. Can you turn this down just a little bit? I'm getting a lot of feedback. The transfiguration of our Lord is an astonishing account with many moving parts. We've just got all kinds of stuff going on, don't we? We got them going up the mountain, and according to Luke, the disciples get up there just before Jesus is doing his thing and they fall asleep. So it must have been a climb because they were tired. Okay? But Jesus all of a sudden is radiating with his divine glory and brightness, so bright they couldn't hardly describe it. And then they look up and whoops, he's talking to Moses and Elijah. Luke tells us it's about what's about to happen to him. So we have all that going on, and about time they get used to that, oop, then we have a cloud roll in, and out of this cloud comes a booming, mighty voice from heaven. There's all kinds of stuff here to look at, but we have to look at it as if we're Peter, James, and John, right? Because that's kind of who we are. We're his disciples. We're his followers. And so as we look at this Mount of Transfiguration and how Jesus was there receiving from Moses and Elijah, we also see the disciples receiving because as Wolf Mueller says, the glory of the Transfiguration is a preface to the glory of the cross. That puts us in a unique position. Because the first thing we see is what the disciples in their humanness want to do. As Luke says, they were sleeping and all of a sudden they woke up. Woo! There's Jesus in all of His glory. And He's talking to Moses and Elijah. And according to Luke, He's talking to them about what's coming. You know? And we don't know how that conversation went. We can suppose. Maybe it was a pep talk from Moses and Elijah to Jesus, you know, that says, hey, yep, you got some rough stuff coming. You're going to go to Jerusalem and some things are going to happen, but you know, you can do it. You know, go team. Rah, rah. <laughs> We don't know. But they were there. And as Peter looks at all these things, he comes up with a brilliant idea. This is wonderful. <laughs> this is great. Jesus, let me tell you what I want to do. I'm going to build a tent. I'm going to build one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And we can just stay here in all of this wonderful glory and really enjoy this. Now, I don't know where James and John and Peter were going to sleep. Because he didn't say nothing about six tents. He just said three tents. Okay. And having slept in the dirt and under Hummers in the back of PLSs and stuff, I want a place to sleep. But he wasn't thinking that because he was wrapped up in that which was the glory of all that was going on around him. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But you can't get stuck there. Because we're kind of like that too, aren't we? Yeah. We like the glory of God. We like to see the power of God. <clears throat> we like to see the strength of God. <clears throat> and we want Him to use that for us. Right? It's like, oh God, as I go about my business, bless me. As I go about trying to accumulate my IRS and my 403B plan, bless me. As I'm struggling to parent a teenager or a little one, bless me. Yeah! We like to tap into that, don't we? It's a pretty good deal. And so, yes, we too can kind of be like that. But what we have to understand is that when we see that, that's wonderful. But we can't stop there. Because Jesus has to come down that mountain. And while we love to see Him in His power and His glory and His exaltation and His transfiguredness, we need Jesus bleeding on the cross for us. We need the suffering Jesus. We need the words that He told to the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember as He was talking to them, He said what? Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into His glory? Because that was His mission. That was His goal. 
And so we have to understand that, that yes, we see the disciples having heard this voice from heaven. We see them what? On their faces in fear. We see them with their heads in the dirt because they had seen this glory. They were fearful of that which was happening around him. And so the voice says, this is my son. Listen to him. Now the very chapter before this, what had Jesus told them? He says, wow, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the scribes and the chief priests and be killed and on the third day arise. He had a goal. He had a mission. And even then, Peter, you got to love Peter. Okay? Peter reminds me of me or I remind him of him or something. <laughs> okay, it was at that point that Peter says, oh no, oh no, oh no, right? And Christ turns around and looks at him and says, get behind me Satan. Now he wasn't calling Peter Satan. Okay, he was calling the temptation that Peter was throwing out as from Satan to not go and suffer and die and be whipped and bleed. And so the voice says, listen to him. And as they do, the disciples become afraid. Afraid because they have seen the glory of God. Afraid because they knew their position. Proverbs says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The disciples realized that as they saw His glory, as they saw Him there. And they realized but yes, we wish for the glory train of Jesus. <laughs> because that's the awesome part. That's the woo hoo part. But we have to realize that we've got too many. We've got too many sins. We've got too many times that we didn't live up to that which He would have us be by the power of the Holy Spirit. We realize as we just confessed, right, that we don't always love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't always do the things that we should do. We don't always live in that true fear of our God. We don't always do the things, and so we have too many. Too many sins, too many reasons to fall on our faces in terror before God, because His expectation from Matthew 5 is very simple. Be ye perfect, even as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And we may fool ourselves every now and then into thinking we can do that. But then we hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And he said, be ye perfect. And we realize we ain't perfect because we got too many, too many sins, too many thoughts, too many words that don't live up to that expectation of perfection. And so as the disciples realize this, they put their heads down. And the next thing they know, Jesus is there touching them saying, you got to love this from the angel, from Christ, from wherever it comes from in heaven. Do not be afraid. Because we can be afraid of a lot of things. He says, do not be afraid. And as they look up, it's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> Moses is gone. Elijah is gone. The glory of God is gone. He's back to him, his you know, humiliated self, his humble self as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that has to be. Because as they come down the mountain, it says Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Where he told him he must go. Where he will be whipped betrayed, scourged, where he will be mocked and spit upon and paraded before the people, where he will be condemned to die even though he has no sin. And that is where we see the true glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is where we see him in his purest as he marches toward Jerusalem knowing what's going to happen, knowing what's going to be there when he gets there. As he enters triumphantly knowing that in less than a week he's going to be with Pilate with a crown of thorns upon his head with blood running down his body carrying a cross out to a place on a hill out side of Jerusalem. It's there that we see him in his humiliation dying on the cross is anything but glorious. Anything but wonderful. But that is where he was lifted up. 
lifted up by the great love that he has for all of his creation to die. And yet three days later, as was shared with our kids, they know, he was cool, something miraculous happened. He rose from the dead. And there we see him in glory again, don't we? We see him with the scars of the crucifixion, yet we see him appearing behind closed doors to his disciples saying, My peace I bring to you. We see him in that which is all of his godliness, doing the things that must be done, doing more miracles, eating with his disciples, proclaiming the resurrection, and sharing with them the good news that your sins are forgiven. Now, now we can share in that glory. Now we can share in the fact that your sins are forgiven. That is glorious. That is a true miracle. That is fantastic. Because that is who we are by the power of the Holy Spirit as children of God. Redeemed, restored, and forgiven. Knowing that we before God through the blood of Christ are declared righteous. Wow. That's what this is all about. Transfiguration. He went up the mountain to see, according to Pastor Wolf Mueller. From the height of the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus sees Jerusalem. From the glory of the Transfiguration, Jesus sees the humiliation of his death on the cross. From the splendor of the transfiguration, Jesus sees the sorrow to come. And in the midst of that sorrow, he sees you. Your forgiveness. Your salvation. End quote. Salvation unto life everlasting for heaven and the glory that is there by the power of Jesus Christ. We too will be transfigured on that day. Amen. And now may that peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in our transfigured Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. We now receive this.